Oriental historical memory as political religion, the mnemonical security problem of Eastern Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, King. And, and hello to all. I'm sorry I couldn't be here in the morning. Uh, I had teaching uh, obligations, uh, but I'm all the more uh, happy and, and grateful to be here now in the afternoon. And as you heard from Kinga's uh, introduction, I am not, a, of course, a scholar of religion. I'm a scholar of international relations and security. So my entry point to this theme is very much one of international relations theorists rather than a proper sociologist or, or a religious anthropologist. But of course, also, as Kinga mentioned, I have always been interested in political anthropology. I have studied liminality and more recently rituals. And ever since my doctoral work, uh, I've also always been really passionate about the intersecting trajectories of identity, memory and security politics. Uh, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, particularly uh, in the post Cold War era. <clears throat> so it is from this background I join you today and, and offer my modest contribution to this discussion. And also, uh, Kinga, could you enable me to share the screen? I have some slides. I, uh, <clears throat> Let's see if I can get it going, right? Here we go. You can see the slides, right? Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so the summary of the claims I would like to uh, present to you is basically as follows. Uh, historical memory as sought in recent memory laws in Poland, Ukraine and Russia has been generally ascribed redemptive qualities and functions in the region. So in a sense, we can say that yes, historical memory has been elevated to the status of political or secular religion. The state orchestrated national remembrance practices of Russia and somewhat less prominently in Poland and Ukraine have various affinities with the traditional dimensions of religious experience, such as totalizing ambition, ritualized behavior, and an emphasis on creating a communion-like sociability via public remembrance practices. So if religion can be empirically understood as a system of practices that surround the sacred, along with various rules and rituals and penalties attached to them, the political aspiration and function of these memory laws that I would like to talk about today is comparably focused on warding off and overcoming uh, crisis situations. As a variation on the theme of secular or political religions, historical memory as utilized and crystallized by states in question seeks to maintain people's ability to act in situations in which they run up against their own limits. And yet, of course, when I use this uh, pretty contested term, political religion, I am also, uh, even though, you know, referring back to the classics, such as the French sociologist Raymond Aron and, and, and the Venice uh, political philosopher Erich Vögelin, um, among others, I'm still very conscious and very aware of the limits of this term, political religion, for the cases under scrutiny here. Because historical memory, as it has been uh, institutionalized and orchestrated by the state in Russia, Poland and Ukraine, it does not quite reach the heights of being elevated to the supreme and all-encompassing sphere with an absolute mission, an absolute authority in these societies, as actually was the essence of this original application of the term to the comparative study of national socialism and communism and fascism. But Still, the state-led mnemopolitics in this region do all seek to re-enchant or refuse, if I use the term by uh, the American sociologist Jeffrey Alexander here, uh, the societies in particular ways. So what we witness with these memory laws uh, in question uh, in these countries under observation is really the sacralization and tabooing of certain elements of the political on the one hand. So you have this active depoliticization attempt of memory by intense securitization of it. And then also the concurrent uh, politicization of certain elements inherited from the Christian culture on the other. 
So such legislations as uh, Poland's endeavor to criminalize the attribution of wartime German Nazi crimes to the Polish state or nation of 2018, and, and we know that it didn't end up with this criminalizing clause and, and it's just a civil offense now, but still the attempt was there. And then the Russian legislation protecting Stalinist narratives about the Second World War through criminal measures of 2014 and now with the new constitutional amendment as well. And then Ukraine's contested decommunization laws of 2015. They all seek to raise historical memory effectively above political contestation. By institutionalizing a version of the past as a legally defended and hence also politically untouchable single truth, this narrative is lifted above normal politics, so to speak. By making memory an issue of state security, or more specifically, the issue of the security of state identity as a particular kind of state, historical memory is simultaneously sacralized and depoliticized in these countries. It is effectively pushed out of the open public debate and subjugated to restrictive legal frameworks of permissible discourse and acceptable remembrance practices. Now, of course, I don't want to you know, make it sound uh, as uniform as I just made it sound. There are very important variations and I hope to be able to show uh, some of these variations in a moment. But let me first uh, do some quick uh, sort of definitional ground clearing. What do I mean by some of these key terms that I've thrown out, such as mnemonical security seeking, and it's a real tongue twister, uh, anything mnemonical is. So I'm, I'm basically interested in precisely this dynamic of what uh, scholars uh, starting from, you know, psychology and then traveling on to international relations discipline call ontological security seeking, the security of the self, right? As manifested and mobilized via the legal regulation and governance attempts of historical memory in the region. So seeking the security of state identity by way of freezing a version of the nation's past in memory laws is, I would argue, an instance of this state's attempted establishment of a selective reality of appearances. And yet there is a practical and ethical backlash in the political logic of mnemonic security seeking as a variation of state ontological security seeking because the result is much like it was originally described by Vögelin not self-mastery, but wish fulfillment with counterproductive practical political implications. And of course, you know, also uh, the problematic ethical aspect to all of this. Uh, let me quickly close uh, my unfortunate email on the side so that it wouldn't do this pinging all the time. Thanks. Right. So, um, my question is really, why would these East European states seek international recognition to a particular historical memory narrative in the first place? And my basic premise is very simple. That's the premise of the so-called ontological security theory or ontological security studies in international relations. The problem of survival in international relations is not just the problem of the survival of the body of the state or you know, what is traditionally understood as the territorial intactness of the state or the uh, security of its people or the inviolability of its, its uh, sovereign institutions. It is importantly also about surviving as a certain kind of factor and hence defending and safeguarding one's memory and identity as a state of a particular sort. States seek to secure their understanding of themselves, which might well provide, of course, us with a key to understanding why they would approach their own and others past wrongdoings and the remembrance of the past in particular ways and how, would, how they would also try to police this collective remembering by means of memory law and by certain uh, mnemonical practices and, and uh, remembrance practices. So what I want to do uh, in this uh, now obviously considerably less than 45 minutes I have been left with is to develop a, a theoretical argument to understand the relationship between mnemonic status anxieties and the related international recognition seeking and then memory orders and memory laws in this East European region. In a nutshell, I argue that uh, the mnemopolitical confrontation in the region under scrutiny concerns the status of each state's historical memory narrative 
in an international social hierarchy of remembrance as perceived to be in place by these state actors in question. So such official accounts or state narratives as an American uh, IR scholar Jennifer Dixon calls them, they they are a state's characterization of a particular historical event. They include the nature and scope of the event. And of course, also the state's characterization of its own role and responsibility or its own government's responsibility within this particular event. So this, this idea of an official state narrative drives home the intricate relationship between fiction and fact in historical narratives. Or as we are ever well reminded by the historian Hayden White, events happen, facts are established. So I proceed in two steps. I um, start out by briefly conceptualizing the notion of uh, mnemonical status anxiety, which uh, as I maintain opens up new ways of understanding the incentives and dynamics of legalizing state stories of the past. As a variation of ontological security seeking or the need for a stable, continuous sense of self, mnemonical recognition seeking is effectively a status struggle in a particular memory order, which I understand as a systematic configuration of organizing uh, the collective remembrance of significant historical events at either societal, state, regional, or international level, or, you know, in all at once. Memory laws provide a primary instance of this anxiety management regarding the state's mnemonical standing in the relevant memory order. Turning state endorsed official narratives of the past into law serves as an attempt to settle this nagging mnemonical status anxiety for good. So this is the aspiration behind memory laws. But of course the sort of result tends to be somewhat different usually. And next, I briefly illustrate my argument with the examples of Russia, Poland, and Ukraine, which I then take to be the instances of mnemonical positionalism, mnemonical revisionism, and mnemonical self-emancipation, respectively. And I conclude um, with some brief remarks on um, the uh, ethical problems that are related to mnemonic security seeking by means of precautionary and punitive measures. As I would argue, such memory laws, as we see in cases of Russia and Poland and Ukraine, they really reveal rather than fix these states mnemonic anxiety problems, or what we can call this mnemonic security problem of Eastern Europe more broadly. So uh, let me say a few more words about uh, in the context about these, these terms that might be uh, too big a mouthful to take in all at once. Um, so mnemonic status anxiety, uh, I would suggest, can be observed when a state is uh, pretty openly concerned over the international recognition and validation of its official biographical narrative by the relevant memory order. Such a narrative is usually taken to provide a temporal backbone for the state's consistent sense of self, its ontological continuity and also mnemonic security. The denial of recognition or what the state perceives as misrecognition of its historical self can destabilize um, one's established systems of meaning. It can bring about a sense of disorientation and bring about uh, potentially damage to the state's ability to actually provide a satisfactory self-articulation or agency in the first place. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we can expect uh, a modicum of care and interest and desire to protect and defend one's self-vision on part of any state, of course. Um, and this might overlap but it also might not overlap necessarily with a societal common sense in significant ways. So this is a universal element in many ways of the human condition. But in order to appear on the radar of the study of international politics as a variation of international status seeking behavior, then we have to see this mnemonic status anxiety as empirically palpable positional rivalry over the capacity of these various state actors to participate or set the tone 
uh, in the international memory orders of value about the remembrance of particular past events or figures or, or, or uh, you know, longer storylines. A memory order then entails a set of hegemonic narratives of the defining past events that constitutes and organize identities and values in a given political community, be it national or regional or international, alongside the government, uh, governing arrangements uh, among the subunits of this order, such as you know, principles, rules, institutions, norms. Memory orders, as, as any international orders, uh, or any orders for that matter, are hierarchically organized, uh, orders of power and glory. So they define historical roles of individual and collective actors, uh, along with a relationship to their present entitlements and social recognition and status in particular ways. And of course, you know, again, when I say uh, and describe memory orders in this way, uh, I do admit that obviously they are not absolute and they are always accompanied with, uh, with certain, you know, internal devices and enemies and, and resistance and protest therein. Now, Central and East European memory wars in the post-communist era have been uh, fundamentally underpinned by such status anxieties of, uh, of the regional state's mnemonical standing in various orders of remembrance. So one could say that this well-set Western or Western European memory order of the 20th century with a central aggressor, uh, which was Nazi Germany, and foundational crime, the Holocaust, uh, became fundamentally disturbed with the Eastern enlargement of the European Union due to the post-communist entrance, uh, distinct emphasis on communist crimes and their own national sufferings, rather than, you know, smoothly entering the, the allegedly cosmopolitan memory of uh, Holocaust as, as the, the sort of central, central event in the context of the uh, Second World War. Whereas status claims are most visibly demands for stratified rights or privileges restricted to actors uh, with high enough standing, active international recognition seeking to one's mnemonic self-narrative can be then effectively taken as, as the mnemonic equivalence of status claims in mnemopolitics. So such instances are the expressed attempts, I would suggest, to resolve this anxiety over insufficient or open misrecognition of the said narrative of the state. So basically, when we are observing intensified mnemonic recognition seeking in international bilateral Lateral and multilateral diplomacy, as well as its more publicly oriented performances, we can presume that mnemonic status is of concern to the actors in question. Now, let me make this a little bit more empirically palpable and concrete. So, I don't know how many of you remember the little thing that happened at the end of, of, of 2019. So this is, this is very much the empirical point of departure also for this uh, rather theoretical discussion. Otherwise, the basic suggestion that this memory war in Eastern Europe uh, over you know, how one should uh, and should not, how one can and cannot, and how one must and must not remember the Second World War and its various culprits and victims, uh, this is still very much on in Eastern Europe. And it's not just a metaphorical war. It's also one that has very physical confrontation episodes. Even if you go back to 2007 in Estonia, uh, there was a sort of uh, physical um, confrontation between warriors on different sides uh, over a particular version of how, how we should remember the Second World War. And, and also when we think back of the post Euromaidan Ukraine, and this memory war has become recently reignited again. So at the end of 2019, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin held this rather interesting and really long history lecture in front of the uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, where he admitted that he was personally hurt by the European Parliament resolution of uh, September 2019, which had stated, uh, you know, the historically, pretty sort of evident fact, uh, the Soviet Union's co-responsibility for starting the Second World War with signing the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. 
Act uh, in uh, 1939. So contrarywise, what Putin did in this, in this lecture, he pushed very boldly back, blamed Poland for having signed a comparable non-aggression pact with Hitler in 1934, and blamed Poland for his uh, or its participation in, in uh, the partition, partitioning of Czechoslovakia back in 1938. Now, Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki, who you see on, on the left side of, of this uh, slide, issued a four-page statement in his turn. He accused the Russian president of repeated lies over the history of the war. Uh, and uh, called for Poland to stand up for the truth, I quote him now, not for its own interests, but for the sake of what Europe means. So you see that Europe is very much the audience and very much the terrain, the sort of imaginary terrain of these, of these confrontations. And these moves, of course, further illustrate uh, the contested politics of mnemonic and recognition seeking. Uh, in the region. So in Eastern Europe, you know, it's pretty evident that the memories of the Second World War, Soviet legacy, the regional states, uh, also Holocaust complicity, are still very much at war. And these recent memory wars, such as the, the 2014 Russian memory law, which criminalizes public dissemination of knowingly false information about the activities of the USSR during the Second World War, and then, you know, the Polish amendment uh, to its existing memory law of 2018, whereby it sort of tried to put a lead on anyone trying to suggest that there was also historically some complicity, uh, Polish complicity in, in, uh, in um, you know, crimes against the Jews in Poland during the war. And then Ukraine's post-Maidan decommunization laws uh, they are all instances, if we generalize, uh, they are all instances of attempts to put a political lead on unsuitable memories with a particular version of a state's or nation's identity in question. And of course, not surprisingly, all these cited laws have also generated much international controversy. They also remain ethically debatable to, to various degrees. And all these aforementioned laws also expose nation-specific mnemonical anxieties and attempts to secure a version of a state self by means of fixing this, this um, version of memory that uh, the states want to live with uh, in law, by means of law. And this fixing attempt is precisely the attempt of, uh, you know, building ontological security. It's an expression, it's a symptom of ontological insecurity, you know, expression of a state's uncertainty about uh, its identity and place in the world and a certain lack of uh, self-confidence or trust about the existential parameters of self and social identity. Uh, but it also does indicate this sort of fundamentally upset state agency because of this very, very um, um, uncertainty that and, and uh, law serves as a means or as an attempted means to provide some relief, to provide some sort of fixing to this anxiety, to this uncertainty and, and to this uh, sort of nagging ontological insecurity uh, thereof. Now, when I go to my empirical uh, suggestions, uh, of course, I have to, you know, put in a basic caveat that obviously I cannot do justice to the very complex histories and, and also rather complex mnemopolitical tragic, uh, trajectories and, and strategies of these three states, which of course have also changed quite a bit over the course of the post-Soviet period. I don't want to give an impression that they are somehow, you know, fixed and, and all the same uh, or, or sort of problematic in the same way. I, I do point at the commonalities, but, but I am well aware and, and of course, uh, you know, reflexive about the very fundamental differences between these three cases as well. But I think, you know, for the sake of, you know, this dynamic that I'm interested in, which is this, you know, mnemonic of the status anxiety and how states of different um, weight also according to the standard international relations theory, you know, the, the sort of great power and the more uh, lesser powers such as Poland and Ukraine, how they both, uh, or how they all rather, are still very much driven by the status concerns 
in the NEMO politics and, and how they in a way they adopt a similar set of mechanisms to deal uh, with, uh, with this problem. So all three cases I would suggest provide ample illustration about how status in international politics is also a very social and psychological and cultural phenomenon. It's not something that we should just boil down as often neorealists in international relations theory tend to do to capabilities or the state's relative power position as materially understood, right? So the seeking and maintenance of status, of course, requires considerable political efforts and generally relies on symbolic action. And I would argue that these memory laws indeed allow us to, to probe uh, how this uh, recognition seeking works in practice in the case of these, these three countries. And essentially, I'd suggest that we really need to take seriously these processes of recognition and misrecognition if we want to understand this comp competitive mnemonical um, uh, status seeking in these countries as also a struggle over a particular political subjectivity and, and you know, preferred uh, identity, uh, um, preferred sort of national biographical narrative and its acceptance by the rest of the world in case of, of Poland, Russia and Ukraine. So they are all uh, seeking recognition to their version, state defined version of the past, at the time also fighting against what they understand as denied recognition or misrecognition. And I know that it overcomplicates things, but let me just in very broad brushstrokes uh, say that the problem is here, of course, that you have in a way, uh, two kinds of wrongs, if you will, in the status seeking that are being dealt with by all of the three actors. So I borrow from a legal scholar, an international human rights scholar, Catherine Liu here, who distinguishes between uh, interactional and structural wrongs and hence also interactional justice, truth and justice seeking and structural truth and justice seeking. So obviously they have issues, much more sort of practical issues when it you know, relates to the legacy of the Second World War, for instance, or the legacy of the Soviet period. That is something that you know, is to be sorted out between these actors themselves. Also Ukraine and Poland obviously have issues between themselves in their NEMO politics and not just with Russia. But obviously the more interesting dynamic here is the structural injustice dynamic um, or what is perceived as the structural injustice in, in uh, contemporary international politics in distinct ways by these three actors. So this structural injustice pertains to the perceived misrecognition or lack of recognition by the established actors uh, of the post Second World War mnemonical hierarchies of the West. Uh, in case of Poland and Ukraine. And, uh, and hence, you know, they would also see this as, as the insufficient recognition of their particular sufferings, their experienced wrongs and violations in the context of the World War in these more or less consolidated Western hierarchies of how we think of and remember the Second World War. So basically, this is the you know, trope of communist crimes uh, should be more or less on par or you know, uh, dealt with um, in the same context as, as the Nazi German uh, legacy. Uh, and then in case of Russia, it's a, it's a structural sort of concern of slightly different order. The stru perceived structural wrong in need of correction from the Russian perspective relates rather to the angst over potentially losing its established position among the trendsetters of the hegemonic past narratives in the present due to these very systemic newcomers such as Poland or the Baltic states or Ukraine, uh, due to their successes in tweaking the normative hierarchies and also institutionalized uh, social practices in the European and global mnemonical order of the Second World War to their advantage and to Russia's self-perceived detriment. So Russia is indeed disturbed and hurt by resolutions such as this you know, uh, European Parliament 2019 resolution, which is just one among many actually in the post 2004, post Eastern enlargement uh, European Union history, which you know, refer to the more complex legacy 
uh, and historically indeed from our regional perspective more accurate historical legacy and, and its assessment uh, of the Second World War and, and the Soviet period. So basically for, for Russia the structural injustice is intertwined uh, very much uh, with the sort of broader status concerns of, of Russia in the sense of, of thus, you know, uh, the East European states challenging uh, the Russian narrative of the Second World War from where, of course, Russia emerged or the Soviet Union emerged as, as the great victor, but also as a great power with a particular special status in the United Nations system, now becomes, you know, constantly undermined and eroded. So in Russia state discourse, the status of Russia as the major victorious power over Nazism in the Second World War should really go universally recognized and appraised without saying. So this is very much, you know, a disrespectful move that, uh, that undermines Russia's third place in the international memory order, but in the broader sort of international power uh, setting, if you will, uh, that emerged after the Second World War. And of course, what makes it particularly aggravating from the Russian perspective is that this attack comes from these former vassals, so to speak, the supposed inferiors. So this adds this, this uh, you know, additionally aggravating dynamic for Russia. So, um, so Russia in that sense provides uh, you know, from my perspective, a pretty quintessential case of mnemonical positionalism with its militant stance towards uh, the historical remembrance of World War II. In congruence with the victorious powers alleged right to also define the legitimate frames of remembrance for the rest of the world. So Russia is normatively satisfied with and also highly protective of this international order that emerged post Second World War and of course of the privileged institutionalization of Russia's own position in it or its legal and political predecessors, USSR's position in it. So it is increasingly concerned about its material status slippage along with this unraveling of the memory order and Russia's deteriorating position in the internal stratification of this order throughout the 2000s really. So <clears throat> since the Putin regime sees of course no reason to alter the post-1945 Western mnemonical canon focused on Nazi German aggression and international crimes rather than you know bringing in or, 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 or speaking about the, the communist deeds on par uh, or as part of this conversation the Putin regime has very vehemently opposed any downplaying of the USSR's role in ending the Second World War. So you could say that this victory of World War II really has emerged as a sacred place in the political but also broader public and institutional memory of post-Soviet Russia, which of course also justifies constant political policing and defense of the state's spotless heroic victor narrative in the international arena. So, you know, that also puts this, this top level admittance of being hurt by the European Parliament resolution, which maintained that indeed molotov ribbentrop Pact of 23rd of August 1939 between communist uh, Soviet Union and Nazi Germany paved the way for the outbreak of the Second World War. So hence, you know, we can see uh, where, this, where this being hurt comes from uh, pretty clearly. So, Russia's pained reaction to this resolution, which of course also not uh, incidentally perhaps was motioned originally by a group of predominantly Central and East European uh, members of European Parliament, uh, acknowledged also a straightforward continuity between the Soviet Union and contemporary Russian Federation. So Putin, I think, captured it pretty neatly in, in, the, in the sentence that, and I quote him, when they talk about the Soviet Union, they talk about us." End of quote. So in Putin's words, this, this European Parliament resolution, and I quote him again, reveals a deliberate policy aimed at destroying the post-war world order, the conclusions of the Nuremberg Tribunal and the efforts of the international community to create, after the victorious 1945, universal international institutions 
the foundations of the entire post-war Europe posing a threat to the fundamental principles of world order. So to drive it home, it's not just, you know, if it ever was sort of just uh, about memory order, but it's, it's how this particular mnemonic narrative is integral to this world order, post-war world order in which Russia has inherited from the Soviet Union a privileged position and that it is very defensive about, right? So they are fundamentally related to each other. And hence always this, this resort back to the uh, broader discussion about how these new countries uh, or, or you know, neo-fascist countries in the region are really trying to undermine Russia's position in, in the world per se, rather than somehow, you know, reveal uh, holes uh, in its mnemonic self-narrative. And hence we see how this cult of war, as some scholars would call it, or the war myth really praises Russia as the continuator state of the USSR and also the world savior from Nazism on the premises that without the Red Army eventually crushing the Nazi onslaught on the Eastern Front, the Western Allied forces would not in fact have defeated uh, Germany. So, you know, hence you have this, get this selective narrative. So, so you know, the victory is, is, um, is highlighted, whereas uh, the less comfortable elements such as the already mentioned Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact or what is known as the non-aggression treaty between the Nazi Germany and, and the Soviet Union um, um, is, is basically, you know, relativized or pushed aside uh, because it was necessary for the exclusively peaceful goals of the Soviet foreign policy. And of course, you know, the sort of exclusive liberation narrative of the Eastern Europe post-war is, is an integral part of, of the same logic. And against this backdrop, you know, what we have been witnessing in the recent decade or so, the, uh, the removal of Soviet World War II commemorative monuments across the former Soviet-dominated space, and then these memory laws in, you know, Poland, in Ukraine, uh, the Baltic states, uh, which all insist fundamentally on the independent political subjectivity that was violated by the Soviets. You can see why this really bothers the you know this story that russia wants the world to know about itself about you know it's it's sort of historical predecessor and why why this is in fundamental conflict and why this presents a fundamental challenge to the russian story so to speak and this of course you know unsurprisingly has also invariably resulted in wounded and rather militant reactions on russia's part intense accusations of historical revisionism that of and when we look now at the policy documents since already the 2008 Foreign Policy Concept of the Russian Federation, Russia has publicly refuted this historical revisionism, which is, of course, a tendency that is exclusively reserved for its former Soviet um, dependent states and satellites, but also to the West at large. It's not something that Russia ever is, uh, is itself participant uh, in. So, you know, the legal apex is this memory law that I mentioned of 2014, basically the addition uh, to uh, the Russian Penal Code, the Criminal Code, Article 354.1 on the rehabilitation of Nazism, which bans the dissemination of knowingly false information on the activities of the USSR during World War II, and also, uh, you know, bans any uh, information that would express obvious disrespect to the society concerning days of military glory and, and Russia's memorial dates and so on and so forth. It also stipulates concrete penalties. So these are, uh, this is a punitive memory law. It, it very sort of concretely, strictly regulates the boundaries of legitimate remembrance with concrete consequences for real people. Uh, so, you know, the Russian historian Nikolai Kov Koposov has called it also as perhaps the most flagrant example of protecting thereby the memory of Stalinism from that of its victims, which is pretty much the uh, other direction of a memory law if you compare it to the more human rights driven uh, or human rights concerns driven um, Holocaust uh, denial banning laws uh, of, of Western Europe. 
So it's, it's an instance of the sort of whitewashing uh, national narrative, which is a very selective uh, narrative indeed. And this trend is only further continued by the recently approved amendments to the constitution of the Russian Federation, including a clause on the constitutional protection of the historical truth. And I just wanted to add you this, this uh, really sort of symptomatic statement by um, a Russian representative to an also interesting uh, event in the sequence of these memory wars. It was organized by my own native Estonia. It was a virtual event to commemorate the uh, end of the Second World War, uh, the spring when everyone was, you know, in lockdown. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's worth actually checking in and, and, and listening to these different, uh, different interventions by different state representatives. And this, this message by the Russian representative pretty nicely captures the, the core elements of this, um, of this mnemonic positionalism that I described um, as, uh, as the sort of main mnemopolitical trajectory of, of uh, Russia's memory law, but also its, its broader mnemopolitics. Um, let me move on because the time uh, is, is running out, otherwise, to the case of Poland. And again, um, I mean, you know, these, these are clickable links. Uh, they are just that to sort of mark the debate for now. So Poland, in that sense, is, is a very interesting case, of course, as well. It offers an instance of a late comer. Uh, in this post-Second World War established memory order of remembering the key culprits and victims of the war. So Polish uh, anti-communist politics throughout the 2000s really uh, has been oriented to change this hegemonic narrative of World War II with an eye on including the USSR as the main aggressor next to Nazi Germany from the outset. So you see that, you know, sort of uh, in, in principle, it is very much ideologically moving in a different direction compared to the Russian trajectory. But in terms of the means, again, the similarities are bigger than, than differences, right? So Poland has sought to revise these normative conclusions that were drawn from the Second World War uh, for the present and in that sense correct what it perceives as the structural injustice which has placed Poland in this unjust, objectionable social policy. And uh, Poland has, in that sense, been really keen uh, not to allow any spots in its historical memory and, uh, and it being remembered as one of the you know, most gravely victimized states in the context of, of the Second World War and the two clashing totalitarian war machines, if you will. So, <clears throat> you know, this, this uh, direction of Polish memory politics, the flair of Polish memory politics um, under the government of the Law and Justice Party in particular, has really focused on securing this international recognition to the national heroism and sacrifice of Poland in the Second World War and its sort of spotless victim status. And this, this Holocaust debacle or the Holocaust law debacle as, as is often and often used shorthand, it's not a very, you know, suitable shorthand actually, but this very nicely illustrates the struggle. I don't have a time really to go into details now anymore, but basically we are talking about this amendment that was introduced to the Polish Institute of National Remembrance Act and this uh, novel addendum to this already existing memory law uh, basically, uh, you know, initially sought to penalize defamation of the Polish state and nation. So penalize anyone who, you know, would have suggested that um, Poles had also something to do with the killing of the Jews, if I simplify it crudely, right? So what started out as a very legitimate uh, political grievance over, you know, these oft used uh, careless um, diplomatic trope of referring to um, Nazi death camps because they were physically located in the to Polish territory uh, in majority as, as Polish death camps actually ended up as the policing attempt of the good name and honor of Poland. And this is also, you know, where the problem very much lies. We see this curious 
sort of appropriation of Holocaust memory in a way, in the struggle for the, you know, the greatest victim status. Something that um, uh, Professor Yelena Supotic has, has written about in her book, Yellow Star, Red Star, Holocaust Remembrance um, After Communism. So for Poland, this was very much the struggle uh, over, you know, uh, getting recognition to its potless victim status because it had been denied the fruits of victory as the results of the Alta Conference in the Second World War. And I'm now, you know, drawing this close because, uh, because otherwise we won't have time uh, any, for any interaction. And then Ukraine, you know, again, uh, we can take with its, uh, with its uh, attempts to break free from the Soviet tradition and also sort of post Soviet Russian tradition of how to relate to the Second World War. This, this decommunization laws as they appeared in the context of, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, the uh, sort of revolution of dignity in Kiev, but on the other hand, also the hybrid war that was already gaining pace then. Uh, in the eastern parts of the country, these decommunization laws we can think, take as, as basically mnemonic security devices that also seek to buttress a particular national narrative. And of course, again, they highlight the selectivity of this endeavor, because when they talk about honoring the, the Ukrainian national heroes, they don't talk about the, their crimes uh, in the context of um, you know, that also occurred in the context of the Second World War <clears throat> vis-a-vis uh, the Jewish population of Ukraine. But basically, you know, if we want to use a label, we can call these laws uh, sort of mnemonic instances of mnemonic self-emancipation. Okay, and basically this is where I would conclude. You see, hopefully, <clears throat> and those of you who know these, these laws and these, these policies in more granular detail, there are obviously distinct aims and trajectories of these laws, but uh, there are also very notable similarities in the thrust of these uh, mnemonic recognition seeking, mnemonic security seeking devices. So, you know, all these laws in a way seek to defend a sanitized and exclusionary national self vision. They also present a binary and rather simplistic narrative of the past, usually where titular nations are you know, either exclusively portrayed as victims or heroes for the purposes of thus securing contemporary states' identities. And of course, I, you know, I can throw it out there and, and we can discuss it further. Maybe this is obviously uh, ethically uh, problematic, but also rather counterproductive in practical policy terms, as we have also seen in all these cases. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I'm uh, excited to hear your questions.